Good morning. Welcome to Ocean City Baptist Church this morning. Um, hope you've come ready to worship. We have a special morning where we are dedicating um, some babies to the Lord, some not so much babies anymore, and, and, and not so much dedicating the babies as dedicating the parents to the Lord. And uh, so let's go ahead, go ahead and join us standing and let's go to him. Lord, we love you so much. Thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to uh, worship this morning, Lord. Lord, all that uh, goes on is in your hands. You knew. You're surprised by nothing. Whatever the events of our week are, Lord, um, it, it is in your plan. Um, and, and you have allowed. And I pray that you would uh, get a hold of our hearts this morning, change us in ways that we need changed, and, and uh, help us to turn to you where we need to turn to you in Jesus' name. In my weakest moment, I see you shaking your head in disgrace. I can read the disappointment written all over your face. Here comes those whispers in my ear saying who do you think you are looks like you're on your own from here this grace could never reach that far but in the shadow of this shame beat down by all the blame i hear you call my name saying it's no longer the way it feels when mercy floods a thirsty soul that broken sight begins to heal and grace returns what guilty stole but in the shadow of this shame
be mindful of, but what do you see? That's worth a look in our way. We are free in ways that we never should be. Sweet relief from the grip of the chain. Such a tiny offering compared to Calvary. Nevertheless, we lay this at your feet. It's such a tiny.
Oh, y'all can have a seat. Good morning. Welcome to Ocean City Baptist Church. Are y'all excited to be here? Well, you're about to be exciting, uh, excited because we have a very special service this morning. And I want to go ahead and invite Corey and Simona and CJ and their family up here. You guys can come to this side. And is crew here yet? Or almost. <laughs> almost. Uh, I see him coming in right now. Perfect timing, Josh. Come on up. <laughs> Josh and uh, at least you can come up too. We are, are super excited to do a what we call a baby dedication service today. And I want to, Troy, I'm going to move this, but we'll move it right back here in a minute. So you guys can come to this side right here because this is your family so they can see crew. It is definitely Crew's fault. Well, yes, this is the first thing. See, it, it's fine. We're here. Oh, my goodness. CJ, how you doing, buddy? Dora, too. I did not know that. You guys can come forward. I love this. Yes. Thank you. We're going to do this on the fly. We can do this. Yeah. And you guys, why don't you step in the middle then, and then they can have this spot, and there they're all here. And I will go down because nobody wants to see me when you got these cute babies up here. So. Oh. <laughs> so we're now we're having a uh, greeting time in at the uh, baby dad. This is great. Uh, this is Josh and Alicia, and Lila, and this is Crew, and um. You guys, I want to get out of the way so people can take pictures. Um, and you guys are here to dedicate your child to the Lord, right? Crew to the Lord. When was Crew born? March 16th this year, 12 years exactly after he was born. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Um, and this family, I love this family. We've been, we, they were supposed to do it uh, back in um, Mother Mother's Day, and Crew was supposed to be a part of that, but we had some issues there, and we're here today. Um, and it's great to see you guys. And crew, you look good. Do you have anything to say? <laughs> no. No. He's a little bummed. He's a Phillies. Oh, they're still they're still fine. He's a Phillies fan, so pray for him. Um, <laughs> and I I know you guys know Corey and Simona and their children, Cora and Maya. But I don't know if you met CJ yet. CJ was born in 2020, right? When was when is his birthday? June 26. June 26. And CJ, do you have anything to say? No. <laughs> <laughs> CJ, uh, if you guys, Corey and I grew up together, became friends probably, what, sixth grade? And, like, this is a friend for life. This is, we're brothers now. We really are. We used to do a little TV show, some of you might remember, where we sang corn, corn, corn everywhere. <laughs> and um, it's really fun. Now our kids are getting to play basketball together. Corey's been coaching my daughter and just seeing great stuff with that and being able to be a part in their lives again with this and I, I it's just really cool to see this so um, just pray for CJ because he's got a dad that's pretty hard isn't he Maya yeah. at least on the basketball court he's nice at home yeah yeah, yeah see <laughs> yeah uh, all right so you guys tell us who you are because now we're getting to know you all so tell us my name is Sved Tia and Tia and this is Dora yeah. Laura Laura so I have a gift for them, but I don't. But we'll get one for you guys, because I was not. I'm sorry. I should. I'm very, very unorganized pastor at times, and this is very seen here. And what's your girls' names? Ella, Gemma. Gemma. Nice to have you guys. And you guys, you guys realize what we're doing today—a baby dedication and all that. Do you guys? And and Lord, do you want to say anything? <laughs> well. But let me explain to everybody here what they're doing, what you guys are doing today, because they may not know. Uh, at OCBC, we believe that a baby is not able to understand at this point in their life the sacrifice Christ made for them. They don't understand that the sin that had to be punished uh, and, and that Jesus took that punishment for their sin. Um, we do believe at a certain age they will come to know th that and understand that. What age that is, that can be up for debate, right? But we also believe that the most important decision they'll ever make is to follow Jesus. Amen? And we want them to give their heart to the Lord. We believe that Jesus is a, the foundation to a good life. 
and the only way to eternal life. And the goal of parenting is to point them to Jesus. That is the goal of parenting. Uh, There's a lot of things that your child will be involved in. They'll get involved in many different things, sports, extracurricular activities, music probably, right? Um, But the most important thing that we truly want these children to do is to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And so we want to pray for them to do that. And these parents today are vowing before God. This is why we don't baptize them, because we're not washing away any original sin. Uh, We don't want to confuse them. We believe that one day when they make that decision, that they'll make that decision to follow Christ, that they will then follow Christ in believer's baptism. But what we want is the the, the children to come to that knowledge so the parents are dedicating their home to the Lord. They've already done that. It's just kind of a sacred vow before you guys. And before God, that they're going to strive to do this. So just as Hannah offered Samuel back to God in 1 Samuel chapter 1 and 2, 3, we bring our children before God and give them back to God. You guys understand that's what you're doing today? So I'm going to ask you all a few questions, and then you guys are going to answer the parents we do. All right, now the children, you guys are here just to support, and there will be a time for you, and there will be a time for you as well, Lila, so you guys be ready, okay? But so I want to ask each couple, first of all, Do you parents acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord of your own life and personal Savior? You do. Do you promise to bring up this child in the knowledge and the word of God so that early in life the great gospel promise will be fulfilled in their life and in your home, which tells us to believe in Jesus and be saved? By dedicating your child to the Lord and bringing them before the church, Do you offer them before God in a service of worship? And will you seek to train and educate them in the Lord so that they shall grow even as Jesus grew in wisdom, stature, and favor with God and man? Will you seek dependence upon divine help for strength and wisdom to faithfully discharge the duties of a parent? And having purposed this in your hearts, do you promise to strive by precept and example using the many agencies of the church to train up your child to love God that their family and others in the spirit of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, will confess Jesus as Lord. And now, having presented your child in dedication to God, do you also desire to reconsecrate yourself to Christ by striving to live exemplary lives, relying upon the grace of God and the Holy Spirit? Awesome. So what these families have done is they stood before you and declared, just like Joshua did, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We want to give you guys a gift, as I said, and we're going to get one for you, I promise, okay? But we have a small gift. This is a gift of a Bible, but it's not necessarily the Bible. It's called the Jesus Storybook Bible. Has anyone seen these? We give these out to all parents because it really shares the story of how every story in the Bible points back to Jesus. I'm going to tell you, I use this for sermon prep. It is good stuff, but it's also very easy to understand, (laughs) all right? And so what I would challenge you to do as parents in this decision is two things, two things. First of all, start praying for your child every day together as a couple. Number two, start reading to your child now, and this is a good place to start with this Jesus Storybook Bible. That's between you and the Lord. You leave this place, but that's my challenge for you guys as you leave here. So we're going to give that to you. Can I give this to you, Lila or Maya? Let's give this to Maya. You hold that. Right there, and Lila. This is from the church, really, not me, but I take credit. And we will get one for you. I do have it. Uh, We'll have it the next week. So last thing I want to do is we want to recognize some other people that are here. First of all, siblings. We've seen them up here, right? And then we have some aunts and uncles and grandparents and cousins, maybe, maybe godparents. All right, you two have a major role in this decision, right? Um. By being here today, do you agree with the parents' decision to raise them in a Christian home? And I encourage you to support this decision in days to come. There may be days you need to step back, and there may be days you need to step in. You may have to help veer the family and the child in the right direction. And so if you support this decision, and you agree with the parents and the goal to raise child, and you consecrate your life back to the Lord so that you will help them in these biblical teachings. Would you indicate that by letting us know by standing up? Just as family and aunts and uncles. (laughs) 
Awesome. You stay standing. Don't get down, Igor. I know you want to. All right. But here's your first line of defense when it comes to, as we look at today, the strategies of Satan to come. You have your family, your ultimate family, but we also have something else. When uh, the Bible talks about your church family, when Jesus came, he called anyone who believes and does the will of the Lord his family. And so, like I said, Corey and I are not brothers necessarily by blood, but Corey has always been a brother to me in many, many ways. And here you have many other brothers and sisters in Christ that love you guys and that believe in this decision. And I want to ask you as a church, if you support these families and that you also will consecrate your life to help them raise this, these children to love the Lord and believe in Christ, would you also indicate that by showing your support and stand right now? I love kids. I really do. And I love babies. And I love that our church is growing in this way. <laughs> and I want to pray for you guys. And I'll come up with you now and stand with you. And I want you to see all these babysitters you have now. <laughs> all right. Let's, uh, let's pray. Lord, thank you for each of these families, for this decision they have made, Lord, to follow you. And now, Lord, to try to raise their child also to know the ways and know your ways and love you as well. I pray, Lord, that you'll give them strength in the days ahead. No matter what may come, Lord, may they overcome in the power of the, the blood and also in the strength of their testimony. Lord, be with these families. Help them each, brothers and sisters, grandparents, aunts and uncles, each to, Lord, do their role and show them your, your life and who you are by the way we live. And we ask you. come forward and they're going to lead you in a song but let them them come and um, get this get these down no you guys can go down now thank you very much you all can have a seat too thank you thank you a lot of other uh, churches, by that I mean maybe like the Catholic Church, the Methodist Church, not here in Ocean City, just broadly speaking, do a better job at something than the Baptist Church does, and that is speaking and praying blessings over each other. And oftentimes they'll end a service with one of those things. Thank you. Um, and, and I thought a song we learned a few weeks ago together would be just appropriate for this. And the words are, the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. Um, those words are powerful words. There, there's a word in here that we sing over and over saying amen. And I talked a few weeks ago many times that we use that word throughout the day. Really means you can open your eyes now. I'm done praying, right? And and but really that word means I've had a good day. Um, and so we want to celebrate that this morning and sing His blessing over not just the children here, but each other um, for these words given to us from God. Go ahead and join us here. to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.
face shine upon be gracious to you the lord turn his face toward you and give you peace amen a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and your children and your children may his favor shine upon you be gracious to you the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace Lord it's our prayer for all here this morning thank you for giving us this prayer many many years ago Lord pray for our families and their families and their children and their children, Lord. 
pray that your presence may be upon us for a thousand generations. Lord, even when we don't deserve it and we fall and we mess up, we pray that your favor still shines on us. And we thank you for that truth this morning. Thank you that that is true as your children, whether we ask for it or not. guys can be seated. Great singing this morning. Welcome to go down now if they want or they can stay up here with us because we have a family service. Um, Lord did say... um, Jesus said, let the little children come unto me, for such is the kingdom. Isn't it? There's so much you learn when you see children and how they approach their parents, how they approach uh, God, how they approach church. I have known many of churches that have grown through children's ministry, right? Um, And so I welcome these children in here, and if they are loud and they cry in the midst of it, we are okay. Amen? All right, you go to a church where there's no kids crying, you're probably the only one sitting in it. All right, that's my opinion, all right? But uh, we want children to come, and we want them to learn, and we'll teach them how it goes as uh, we do that. I spent most of the time here doing this baby dedication, so we don't have a long sermon today. We're going to try to get through this pretty quick. But we have been going through Ephesians chapter 6, the armor of God. We compared it to how a football player puts on his uniform and gets ready for the schemes of the devil. And we've been talking about the battle that we're in. The battle is against not flesh, not against others. It's against spiritual forces of weakness. And so we want to be ready for that battle. So we put on the helmet of salvation. He says, put on the full armor of God. Helmet of salvation is this, it protects us from Satan's lies, right? Satan tells you you're nobody, you'll never amount to anything, you're no good at anything. The helmet of salvation says, no, your true identity is in Christ. And in Christ you are chosen, you are a child of God, you are forgiven, you are redeemed. Amen? That was week one. Then it says you take up the shield of faith. Satan will throw things at you that make you question God's goodness and faithfulness in your life. But we are reminded when we take the shield of faith that our circumstance is temporary, that one day we will be with the Lord. And so we carry the faith that we're going to get through this. We will overcome by the blood of God, of Christ, and the word of our testimony. Third, we learned about the sandals, which bring enter and inner peace as we commit to the justice of God. We learn to forgive those who sin against us, and we go to them because we have been forgiven, we forgive others. And so he says, take the, the gospel and the sandals of peace with you and go out and love one another. Amen? That's what we're trying to do. And then last week we looked at the breastplate of righteousness that defends us from the devil's attempt to make us fall for any temptation. We want to live godly lives. So today, what do you think we're looking at? I'll give you a hint. The belt of truth is what it is. It stands firm, verse, six, uh, chapter, uh, verse 14. It says, gird your loins with truth. And we call this the belt of truth. But is the belt really in here? What is this? What's he talking about here, right? Um, It's not really indicative of what is portrayed here by calling it a belt, but it helps us see what's going on. See, when I often think of a belt in today's society, I often think it's the last thing we put on, but it's the first thing Paul mentions. And it's the first thing Paul mentions because it would be the first piece of equipment that a Roman soldier puts on. You say, what do you mean? Well, let me explain. The image of a belt is worn to keep our pants up, right? Or make us look good if you have a big belt buckle, right? All right. It's usually worn outside the pants, but in those days, it was usually worn underneath the clothes, and it functioned to give the soldier support, mainly in his core or midsection. Now, they often wore long garments, so they would tuck the garment in, and it would say, gird up your loins so that when they're in battle and they're running or like people are coming at them, that they wouldn't trip over that long flowing garment, so they have to bring that up and tuck it in, but it was underneath the clothes and it provided support, much like if you want to think of a weightlifter or someone who's moving boxes like into a house, right? They put on a belt to give them more support in their midsection when they're lifting heavier things. That's kind of what is pictured here. In Ephesians 6.14, Paul encourages us to start 
by putting on or girding our loins with truth. With truth. The Roman army would fight in tight formation against other armies who would literally throw themselves against them. So you can imagine how important this piece of equipment was. If they didn't have this support, or if they were tripping over their, their long garment, they would probably be killed. And here Paul tells us, put this on first. And really, when you think about it, this supports all the rest of the equipment. Maybe we should have started with this, right? But I end it with it because I believe this is the, the way the structure of Ephesians leads off. And it gets us to Ephesians chapter 5, and it talks about truth. It talks about us being grounded in truth. And the, the thing that will keep us really fighting back, and not just fighting back, but defending ourselves from the schemes of the wickedness of this world and the dark forces of power, is that we stand firm in the truth, girding our loins with truth. In John 17, Jesus prayed something that I think all of us need to know today and remember today. John 17 is the actual Lord's Prayer. You guys know this, right? When we say the Lord's Prayer, we're actually talking about the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. But the Lord's Prayer was in John 17. He was about to be crucified, and he prays this prayer for his disciples, which also includes us, because he goes on and says in future generations, I pray this too. And he says in John 17, verse 17, sanctify them in the truth. Sanctified means set them apart. What will set us apart is that we are standing firm in the truth. It reminds me, if you go back, um, right after this, Jesus is arrested in John 18. And if you remember the story, he was basically arrested after being betrayed by Judas, one of his close disciples. And he was put on trial and, you know, right in front of the Sanhedrin, which is the Jewish officials, and they find him guilty of blasphemy. And they send him to Pilate. They didn't have the authority to murder him, although they said, we want to kill him. We want him dead. And so they send him to Pilate, who's the authority at this time. He's the Roman official overseeing Israel. And they say, we know this man is causing an uproar. We want you to crucify him. We want you to kill him. We want you to stone him. Whatever you have to do. And Pilate sits before him, and he puts the trial before Jesus. He says, Jesus, who are you? Are you the son of God like they say you are? What's going on here? Why are they bringing you to me? And at this point, what happens is as the Jews take, take him to Pilate, they're causing this uproar and all these things. Pilate starts to question Jesus, and he looks at Jesus, asks him all these things, and then he says this. Therefore, Pilate entered again to the praetorium. He said, he summoned Jesus, said, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Are you saying this on your own initiative? Did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation, your chief priest delivered you to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would be fighting so that I would be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. And then Pilate said to him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say correctly that I'm a king. For this is why I've been born. And for this, I've come into the world to testify to the truth. And everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And Pilate said to him, that is true. And I love that. Because I know as I hear Pilate, and he's, see, he's got all these people in his ear over here telling him all these things about Jesus, and Jesus is like, no, I'm just, my king is not of this world. He's like, I don't, I don't, it's like he's struggling and wrestling with what is true, and I feel this way today. Do you, does anyone else feel this way? Just exasperated with what's true in today's world, right? Can I trust the media today? Can I really trust what they're selling? Or are they just spreading propaganda? Can, can we trust politicians, or they only care about their self-interest and their self-groups, their groups, right? Can we trust them? Can we trust the education system? Is there truth in it? Or are they just feeding a lie that's spreading an agenda, right? I don't know. Am I the only one struggling with this, right? It's hard in today's day and age to believe what is true and what's not. And so we even developed something called fact checkers, right? Who supposedly have done the research to let us know what is true, but then you look and they're paid off by other interest groups and you're like, wait, what is true? Does anyone else feel like Pilate here? I think that's where we can relate. That Jesus prays for us to be sanctified in the truth and then after this in John 17, 17, he says, your word is true. What's interesting is 
John calls Jesus the living word. The word becomes flesh. Which is interesting that Jesus doesn't really answer his question here because it's almost like he looks at Pilate and says, I'm standing right in front of you. And if Jesus is true, here's what we learn. Pilate had it right in front of him and we have the truth right in front of us. It's the word of God. And it's if we'll listen to it and trust it. At the end of Ephesians chapter 5, Paul explains this idea of truth. And again, like I've said, I feel like the, the armor of God here in Ephesians 6 is kind of a summary of the whole book of Ephesians. And so we get to Ephesians chapter 5, and in verse 8 and 9, we read this. For you were formerly darkness, but now you're in the light, the light in the Lord. And he says, walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Paul emphasizes this old nature versus new nature, which we talked about last week, right? He says you're now part of the family of God. You're in the light. You're in the truth. So literally, the parallel here is light and truth, which makes a lot of sense if you think about it, because light exposes what we see, right? Truth exposes what is true and what's real. One of my first memories as a child, I remember... We'd go down and visit my grandparents here in Tennessee, and on one of these trips, the other grandparents lived in Georgia. We were traveling between the two, and we stopped, and I'm not sure exactly what it was. Maybe it was the Forbidden Tavern, and it was in Tennessee. And we stopped to go in these, like, do this tour, and I was young. I was probably eight, nine, maybe seven even. I don't know, but we did this tour of the caverns of these caves and we would take us further and further back into these caves and they had lights out we would see all the different structures, we'd see water coming from and you see like this cool stuff but it did have like lights all up through it and so we get to this one point back fur, fur, far in the cave and they said alright gather your children close because we're going to turn off all the lights and I remember as we stood there they grabbed my dad's hand and they turned off the lights one kid screamed it wasn't me I promise it was pitch dark. You could not see. And th- when they say you could not see your hand right in front of your face, you could not see your hand right in front of your face because there was no light in this place. They had to turn the light back on because that's what exposed what was real, right? Because light exposes what is there. When there's no light, there's no truth. As you keep reading Ephesians 5, he goes on and talks about this. He says, all things become visible when they are exposed by the light, for everything becomes visible is light. And for this reason, it says, awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and let Christ shine on you. So the truth is Christ shining on you, right? That's what it's talking about here. Paul says, wake up and see the truth. Basically, truth is telling it like it is. It's being able to see things as they really are. Light exposes darkness. And the point is, once you come into the light, you see what's really happening. I admit, I, I watch crime shows, you know, CSI, um, some others. I don't know if I'm allowed to mention some. I, I just like to suspense them. I like trying to figure out. I watched Dateline last night, trying to, you know, figure out what's going on in the world. That's my news source, I guess. I don't. They have these flashlights on these crime shows that when you go in, it exposes everything, UV, AE lights, you know, and shows you all the bodily fluids in there. Don't ever take one of those in a hos- uh, hotel room. Uh, just probably never stay in one again. But I think of that, and I think that's what God has given us with the Word of God. When that truth gets in you, it exposes what's real and what's not. And that's the Bible. The Bible serves as both light and truth because it's teaching us And its teachings are in harmony with reality. Satan knows that. And so what's his number one tactic? It's been the number one tactic from the beginning. Let's make him question God's word. What do you do to Eve in the garden? Did God really say? Did God really say that? And that's Satan's tactic still today. It hasn't changed much. He's still trying to get people to question the word of God. And one of the things he does today is, well, did God really say Jesus is the only way to heaven? Come on, you don't really believe that, but the Bible teaches that. That's not something pastors made up and the church made up. This is something from the beginning. It says in Acts 4.12, the Bible's clear, there's no other name by which one must be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is written in the Word of God. It's not hard to interpret. 
But we don't like that. And in the name of tolerance and love, Satan has convinced many that God didn't really say that. He says there are many ways you can get to God. Do whatever you want. But is it true? Is that statement true? Those who refuse to hear the truth are in darkness. And a quick study of religion shows you that not all religion can be true. And there's not a lot of ways to God because each religion teaches that they have the right way to God. But the problem is, let's just take, for example, Jews versus Hindus. Jews, Muslims, and Christians all believe there's one God. Hindus and Buddhists believe there are many gods. Which one's right? Which one's wrong? Which is true? They both can't be true. That goes against reality. Christianity teaches that God's personal, while other religions teach that he's far off and can't be involved in your life. Which one's true? Hindus believe that evil and suffering are an illusion that you made up in your mind, while Muslims believe, no, no, suffering is real. One of them's true, one of them's false. The contradictory views here. Christians believe salvation is by grace through faith, while other religions teach, no, you have to do good works in order to get to heaven. Which one is true? The point is they can't both be true because they contradict each other. It, the law of non-contradictory, a uh, contradiction, sorry, teaches that contradictory claims teach that one is true, one is false. Two plus two is either four, two plus two is either five, right? And for example, if I go up to a friend and I ask the husband, I say, is your wife pregnant? He says, no. And I go up to the wife and says, are you pregnant? She goes, yes. One of them's right and one of them's wrong. I said, well, the husband's not lying. He just hasn't been told yet, right? He's still wrong. One is true, one is not true. Either she's pregnant or she's not pregnant. And second, I, I think it's important, though, here, before we go any further, that we concede to the fact that every religion does have true claims. I, I'm not saying that every religion is off in some of the things they teach. Every religion has some sort of golden rule that teaches us do unto others as you want them to do unto you. That's a true claim, but it doesn't mean that we accept all religions as true because one teaches there's one God, one teaches Jesus is God, one teaches he's not God. Which one is true? In America today, we have fallen. Here's what we have to understand. It's tolerance is a learning to disagree with love and respect. In America today, we have fallen for this lie that we have to accept all beliefs as true in the name of tolerance. Rick Warren said it best. He's the one who wrote the book Purpose Driven Life. He said, our culture has accepted two huge lies. The first is that you have to disagree with someone's lifestyle. You must either hate them or fear them. And the second is that you love, if you love someone, or second is that to love someone means you agree with everything they believe or do. But that's nonsense. You don't have to compromise convictions in order to be compassionate. The definition of tolerance is agreeing to disagree with someone and still treat them with respect, and the Bible teaches us to do that, right? But we speak the truth in love. We have been exposed to the truth, and we are to gird our loins with truth, and so if we gird our loins with truth, we determine what is real and what is fake, and we tell people what is real and what is fake, what is right and what is wrong, what is true and what is false. So how do we do that? Well, we've got to determine something first and foremost. We've got to determine that we can discover truth. There are some people here who says, you will never know what's true and what's not true. I disagree. Truth is knowable. It is not so far from us that we can't figure it out. In fact, the matter is God has revealed to us what is true. He showed us what is true in his word. The, the guy, one of my favorite teachers, Frank Turk, teaches us six things about truth that we have to learn and accept. And number one is this, truth is discovered, not invented. Long before Isaac Newton came into the world, gravity was there. We just give him credit for discovering it, even though God wanted to made it and it was always there, right? We accepted the truth. We discovered it thanks to Newton. Second, truth is transcultural. If something is true, it's true for all people in all places at all times. If I go to Romania and I jump off a bridge, I'm still going to fall. And I'm still probably going to get hurt. Same here. Two plus two is four in America and in China. Might have a different way of saying it because they have different languages, but it's still true. Transcultural. Truth is unchanging. Our beliefs about truth may change, but truth never did. Ask me who, what truth was when I was 18. It's totally different what truth is now. But it was unchanging. It was still the same when I was 18. I just was too hard-headed to accept it. Right? And at one point in history, we all believed that the world was flat. 
We were wrong. The truth never changed. Our beliefs did. Fourth, beliefs cannot change the truth no matter how sincerely they are held. I can believe all day the color of my shirt is pure blue. It's not. It's different colors. It's plaid. It's all that, whatever else. It, I mean, yeah. Right? It doesn't change the fact just because I have convinced you that this is what I believe. No matter how sincerely I have that belief, it doesn't change the fact that it's there. Fifth, truth is not affected by the feelings of the one professing it. Just because I'm arrogant, rude, or obnoxious does not make my statements true. Just like if I'm a humble, meek person doesn't make my statements true. What makes my statement true is truth. God has shown us. And finally, this is the hardest one for our culture. Truth is absolute. Truth is not relative to your opinions. Your opinion and who has the best football team or the best restaurant in town is merely your preference or opinion. I will fight till I'm blue in the face that Duke is the best team. You like go mad and mad at me, right? Truth is, a, a, there's some things that are preference or opinion. When someone says truth is relative, here's how you respond. Is that a relative truth? If they say, oh, there's no absolute truth, you ask, are you absolutely sure? Because that's a contradictory statement in itself. In the statement, that's true for you, but not for me, the proper response is, well, is that statement true for you, or is that true, true for everyone? Y you see the, how it contradicts itself? They're contradictory statements. Satan's a liar. He wants to kill the concept of truth, and we're told to gird our loins with truth. So we have to determine that there is truth, and our job is to discover the truth. And the truth is discovered as we read and hear in the Word of God. This is where God reveals to us the truth. The ultimate fact check here is the Word of God. And so in John chapter 8, Jesus says this amazing statement. He says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You know the Pharisees got upset with him for that? Because the Pharisees understood what Jesus was claiming here. He was claiming to be the truth. He was claiming to be the one sent by God. And they're upset with him because they know if people start believing that, they won't follow what they're teaching, which were, wasn't necessarily true. It was more for their benefit. And so what happens is they get mad at him, and Jesus continues to go on. Look what he says in verse 28. Jesus said, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he. And I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. As he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. And you will know the truth, and the truth will, listen to this, make you what? Free. And they answered him, we are Abraham's descendants. I have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus, this statement here is quoted by so many in the world, right? We love this statement. I mean, John, uh, what is his name? Um, oh, Tom Cruise movie. What was that? Jack Nicholson. Nicholson. Yeah. He, oh, you can't handle the truth, right? That, that, we, that, we love to make this quote here. Like, the, the truth will set you free, right? But, but we often misquote it. What Jesus is saying here is that you can have a lot of information, but that won't set you free. In the context of this passage, what Jesus is teaching, what sets you free is hearing the truth of God's word and putting it into practice. That's what sets you free. See, once you have both these things, you have hearing God's word and obeying God's word and believing it, you walk in his ways, you walk in the light as he is in the light, you gird your loins with truth. And that's where the rest of Ephesians 5 talks about. We don't have time to go through it all. But basically he talks about be careful how you walk, not as one wise man but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. If the days were evil in Paul's day, you better believe they're evil still today. He says don't walk as fools, walk in the truth. Don't be foolish. Understand what the will of the Lord is. You listen to the word of God and you do it. And then this is where he goes. And I don't have time to go through all this, but you go home and read it. He goes to the family. And he talks about in Ephesians chapter 5 how a husband should treat his wife and how a wife should respect her husband and how they submit to one another. And then in Ephesians chapter 6 he talks about the child and, and the parent relationship and how the children are to obey their parents and the, the parents are not to exasperate their children and, and provoke them to anger. He talks about this. Why? Because he understands if you can live out the truth at home, you're going to be more likely to live it out in this world. 
And that's what we have here. That's what is going on here. God's plan for us is to gird up our loins with truth. We walk in the light as he is in the light. And we put on the full armor of God. And really this sums it all up, doesn't it? See, Satan's scheme is to undermine a person's self-confidence by in large part relying on harsh words or actions by the parents. Right? When the child is young, if the parents be so harsh on them, they put this this persona on them, but then God says, no, put on the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation reminds you who you are and your importance in the family of God. He wants to weaken you by giving you anxiety and bringing circumstances into your life that test your faith. He says, don't lose your faith. Put on the full armor of God. Take up the shield of faith. Know that God is good. God is faithful, and this is temporary, right? And then, like, what's he want to do? He wants to rob us of our peace that we have. He creates chaos in our lives, and, and he brings turmoil in our life, and it usually comes in relationships, right? But he says, if you extend forgiveness, he says, you were forgiven. You, you walk righteously, and you, you have the sandals of peace, and then he tempts you to go back to your old ways. I want to follow my old path. I want to do the old thing. When, I, when I, I, I want to live in the flesh, and he's like, no, don't do that. Stop doing that. Put on the breastplate of righteousness and walk in faithfulness to God. And it's all encompassed when we gird our loins with truth and we put it all there because Satan's a liar and a thief and he's set on deceiving us and entangling us in his trap. But remember Jesus' words. You shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. Church, I strongly encourage you to gird up your loins with truth by seeking God and striving to do what's right. Here's how we do it. We speak the truth in love. God's word is the truth. We put it into practice. Sometimes in the pursuit of truth the church has become mean let's just be honest God says speak the truth in love we forget in our passion for truth we forget to have a passion also for souls we need both and so we gird up our loins with truth and we speak the truth in love and that's what we're called to do today church and I encourage you to do that and in some ways that is the speaking the truth that Jesus is the way to salvation would you come to him and then as you become a Christian, it's speaking the truth one to another. Jesus prayed that we be one just as he is one. Sanctify yourself in the truth. In your home, speak the truth in love. Show people Christ by the way we live. And we're not good at it, but we are to strive to be like that, aren't we? So I'll leave us here with this because next week we talk about the sword of the spirit. We're going to get deeper into this word of God and how it speaks truth. But for you today, speak the truth in love with gentleness and reverence for each person. Think of something in your life that you can bring to the Lord right now and say, Lord, I need you to show me and fact check this so that I can live in the truth and gird my loins with truth. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for giving us this truth, Lord. And Lord, help us to decipher what is true and discover it, Lord. We're not always good at that because the world and Satan is so good at just, just distorting it. I pray, Lord, that we won't do that today. I pray, Lord, that we'll speak the truth. And when we find it, Lord, speak it in love for your name's sake, for your glory. And if there's someone who's never walked in that and given their heart to you, I pray they will before they leave. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Now, can you hear me? All right. I just got a few announcements for you. Um, first, after the second service today, we have a new members class, uh, which is, uh, we call it first steps class. So if you'd like to stay for that or come back for that, uh, that'll be right after the second service and they'll meet downstairs. Okay. So we'd love to have you. Um, next week uh, is a special Sunday for us. Uh, the, the morning services will operate just like normal. Okay, so we'll have our 9 o'clock and 10.30 here. Um, uh, but then at 5 p.m. we'll have our Elevate Award Ceremony, uh, and that'll be over at the Convention Center. That is our Elevate program is our sports ministry program. And uh, for the whole fall season, we have been going through uh, just – uh, the Word of God, teaching them biblical principles, and 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 then at this celebration, uh, we really 
uh, try to have a good time with them, but we present who Christ is, present the gospel, um, and, and, and that's what it's all about, isn't it? And, and so that's over at the convention center. Uh, the name of that service is Elevation Celebration. If you think that's really corny, Jason Long came up with that. <laughs> so you need to make sure to say something to him. If you really like it and you think it's catchy, I approved it. <laughs> and so you can thank me after. Um, but uh, we are looking for, for some, uh, uh, some people that could help with, like, greeting and, and ushering people to their seats and things like that. So if you're available to do that, uh, just go downstairs to the table, and you can sign up there or go see Wayne, who's in the back, um, and just let him know that, that you're, you're available to do that. Um, and that would be from, like, 345 until, until the end. Uh, hold on. I've got to identify my face again. All right, then we have our annual business meeting uh, is Wednesday, November 9th at 7 p.m. We'll be voting on the budget for 2023, and we'll also be updating everyone on the, uh, on the vision of the church. So we'd love to have you come out to that. That's Wednesday the 9th at 7 p.m. You'll hear more about that. And then lastly, uh, Pastor Sean's November newsletter is on the back table. If you didn't receive it in an email, we'd love for you to pick it up. Um, and so let's pray, and then you guys are dismissed. Lord, we love you. We thank you for today. We thank you for your word, Lord. And we thank you that, that in your word we find truth. Um, Lord, help us to, to, to live our lives in the truth. Help us to, uh, to honor you, Lord, and to teach others the truth in love. Um, we thank you that, that you have come and you died on the cross for our sins and that we have salvation through you. Please bless us as we go out, Lord. Uh, help us to be a light and salt for you. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.